My name is Brenda Berkman and I'm a retired New York City fire officer. Um, I am currently uh, working as a professional artist. When I was growing up there were very few career options for, for young women. Um, basically you would teach or you would be a nurse or you would be a secretary. It was also the case that the minute that you became pregnant, whoosh, the job went away. Um, when I was growing up, I had a series of teachers who had to stop teaching. They weren't, they weren't physically disabled. In many cases, they weren't even you know, visibly pregnant yet, but they had told the school system, I'm pregnant. That was the end of it. You know, they, they didn't teach anymore. So, I, I had as role models basically teachers. I didn't want to be a nurse. I didn't want to be, um, at one point I thought about going into the military, but then in the military in those days, unless you were a nurse or a secretary, you know, you didn't, you didn't really have any career options. Me, I wanted to have a gun. I wanted to do combat. I wanted to, you know, do the whole nine yards. I didn't want to sit behind a desk. So I decided I would go into teaching and then I went off to graduate school at Indiana University in history. Um, I was lucky enough to get a full scholarship for my PhD. And uh, while I was in uh, graduate school, I decided that really um, teaching history was pretty much a, a no-go at that point. Jobs were very few and far between at the college level. And I had spent a summer working in my late father-in-law's law office. He did a lot of work involving sex discrimination for plaintiffs. And I thought, wow, this is very interesting. Maybe I'll apply and go to law school. So I took the LSATs and I got into NYU. While I was there, met quite a few fire officers um, because my, ex -father, my late father-in-law had represented the New York City Fire Officers Union for 30 years and so I met all these fire officers and I had always had sort of in the back of my mind a, an interest in police or fire as a job. My parents were really um, emphatic about civil services being a great career because you had a pension and it was a secure job and you know you could take tests and go up for promotion and all those kinds of things. So, so I met these guys in the fire department and lo and behold I discovered that the fire department is not hiring women. Never had hired a single woman. It didn't matter if you were an Olympic caliber athlete, you were not going to get hired by the New York City Fire Department. You literally could not file to take the civil service exam if you were female. I thought, that's stupid, but as a matter of fact, the, uh, the police department had just been going through its whole thing about allowing women out on patrol for the first time. And there had been a, uh, a couple of senior police women who had been bringing lawsuits against the department because they wanted to take promotional tests and they wanted to do, you know, go up in, in ranks and their opportunities were limited purely because they were women. They had separate tests, they had separate job responsibilities, everything. So they had been fighting that since the passage of Title VII and its application to state and local governments. I knew that the fire department was going to have to open its test to women. And sure enough, 1977, when I was a senior in law school, I'd been going down to, you know, calling personnel, asking them, when are you going to open this test up? You know, when you're giving the next firefighter exam and, you know, call me when this is going to happen and all this, nobody ever got a hold of me or anything. My next door neighbor in law school knocks on my door one night and says, I just saw an ad on television saying that the fire department's given a test for a firefighter and you have like two days left to file for this test. So even though I was finishing up law school, I went down and filed for the firefighter exam. And I was a marathon runner. I was in incredibly good shape, not like I look now. I was in really good physical condition. And uh, I went down and filed for the firefighter test. And 
I took and passed the, um, the written portion of the exam, which was given in late 1977. And then still, while I'm in law school, in 1978, they started giving the physical portion of the exam. And the physical portion of the exam was changed because, haha, -ha, women were applying to become firefighters. The previous tests had been pass-fail. They made uh, the new test rank-ordered, and they also um, changed the events on, the, on the, uh, the things that you had to do in order to pass the test. And nobody, nobody passed. So I thought to myself, you know, this is ridiculous. I'm in, I'm in really good physical condition. I think I could be trained to be a firefighter which is the whole point of these exams. You're supposed to be trained to be a firefighter, not just sort of walk in knowing what to do. And surely there must be some woman in the city of New York who could be trained to be a firefighter. So that's when I went and I talked to Laura Sager, who was in charge of the Women's Rights Clinic at NYU, where I was still in law school. And I said to Laura, ha, huh? I said, Laura, you know, listen, this test is completely bogus. It's not job related and it discriminates against women. There's not a single woman there. They're reporting this in the papers. There's not a single woman that passed this test. Let's go down, let's talk to the head of personnel and tell this guy, this test is, should be redeveloped. You should allow the women who took the test and failed it to take the new test. And I'm sure we can settle this case in no time. Ha ha, we went down there with, with uh, Bella Abzug and, and the, the guy, Tom Roach, who was head of personnel, he just blew us off. He said, no, we're not, we think it's a valid test, we're not gonna do anything about this test. So I convinced Laura to represent me in a lawsuit against the New York City Fire Department. In the meantime, I graduate, I take the bar exam and pass, and I'm practicing law. Laura, to her eternal credit, the, realizes this is going to be a massive case and you know the city's gonna gonna mount a lot of resources against us so she went and she got a white shoe law from Deborah Voice and Plimpton to agree to come on as, as co-counsel I thought I could be a good firefighter and I thought other women could be good firefighters and I thought the fire service could benefit from having women in the fire department and so I thought, I'm going to do this. I was tired of being told, you can't do that because you're a girl. I heard that so much, or you have to do this because you're a girl. In my life, I tried to create opportunities for women and to make our society the kind of place where boys and girls could pursue their passion without having to uh, be restricted by gender stereotypes. The thing that stands out in my mind most about 9-11 was, as a first responder here, was how incredibly helpless we felt when we arrived here after the towers fell. Um, because the magnitude of the disaster was beyond comprehension. It was beyond the resources that we had to deal with it. I came, when I got here, I had no breathing apparatus, I had no means of communication. I just had basically the bunker gear on my back and a, a bunch of firefighters with me that had like a, a spare hand tool. And we had no water because the water mains were all broken. We were looking at this seven story burning pile of debris with all the smaller buildings and every building around here on fire. Uh, around us and our command structure wiped out and no way of communicating and um, it was nuts and uh, you know what we, we did what we could but uh, it was chaotic and um, and we just uh, did not have the tools 
to deal with that situation. There's a lot of construction going on behind me here, and that's the rebuilding of the Trade Center. And it needs to be done because, you know, we can't have a vacant lot down here in Lower Manhattan. And the faster it goes, the more we're going to see that the Memorial and Museum is a proper way of honoring and remembering the lives that were lost here on 9-11. Things change. <clears throat> so, being here at the Trade Center, after we finished working down here in 2002 trying to recover remains, I didn't like to come to Lower Manhattan at all. And then I got involved with the Tribute Center across the street that was established by the 9-11 Families Association. And as a volunteer, I started leading walking tours down here for mainly tourists. And so I have seen the changes down here. And a lot of us are very uh, anxious, uh, very happy to see that finally we're going to get part of the memorial opened up and eventually also the museum opened up so that we, you know, there would be a proper remembrance of the people whose lives were lost here that day. I, I feel for the people that live around here and work around here that they've had this empty lot and this construction site all this time because, you know, it's a constant reminder of destruction. And uh, now we're seeing a rebuilding. And to the extent that we are able to rebuild and still remember and respect and honor the people who lost their lives down here, then it's all the good thing.